Is it a mess out there, or is it my imagination? I mean, is it just nuts? Just so much chaos, you know? I heard this one time. This is what inspired this, was an acrostic for God, G-O-D, was good orderly direction. Have you heard, you heard these other acronyms that people have? Ego, edging God out. Um, fear, forget everything and run. Heard that one? So when I heard this, I was kind of excited about it because it made sense to me that, that God would bring order to the disorder that we have in this world because we started from a point of disorder, didn't we? Right? Because in, in um, Genesis it says that, that the, in the beginning, you know, the world was without form, that was void, and that God spoke our universe into existence. He brought order and direction to the disorderly. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So God's got this all worked out in advance. That we may not understand it doesn't mean that it's not in play. That we may not um, be able to figure out what God's thinking doesn't mean that he's making a mistake. There is a truth, and um, I know I've said this before, if you don't believe it, that's fine, but you're wrong. And the Bible is the true inspired written word of the only God of this universe, the God. Now, there are other gods that people worship, but they're not gods. They're just entities that do not possess the power of the God that created all these things. So in the beginning, there was chaos, right? Genesis 1, 1 to 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. What is it? You know, people talk about, well, the earth is billions of years old. Well, the earth as we know it is 6,000 years old because God came and created that. And whether there was some mess before that or not, it says that when, when God spoke all of this into existence, when he, the earth was, was brought into order, that it was first there without form and void. It's a little heavy for me to really understand what exactly that means. That's one of those physics questions I have when I get to heaven as to exactly what that meant. In Genesis 1, 1 to 2 in the Living Bible, it says, When God began creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was a shapeless, chaotic mess. Just a different way of understanding it. And in the Hebrew, there's a term called tohu wabohu, which describes this. And it's Wow. And it's a difficult word to understand, and it was a difficult word for the scholars to define. I don't know what's happening. But it was, it was kind of like, let me reconnect here, guys, sorry. It was kind of like what we would think of as the word helter-skelter. Have you ever heard that? Okay, and what does helter-skelter mean? Right, it's a mess, and things are just completely out of control. I just like this presentation right now. And let me try it again. And we're connecting. Yeah, we, we just may, uh, we may have to do this without the computer if you guys are okay with that. Because we've had this before, right? We've had this problem once before where it didn't connect. So anyway, we'll do our best. If it comes back up, we'll, uh, we'll work it. If not, we won't worry about it. No, no, that's not, that's not the problem. Don't, don't hit that. No, but there's a, there's a one thing. No, no, it's not, it's not that. Trust me, this is a connection directly to the receiver in the box. And we are back up. Okay. Okay. So, so in this beginning, in this time of chaos, this tohu wabohu, where, uh, where everything was out of control and a mess, God brought order by, by speaking this into existence. So in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, 
which he had done. So we come into the picture with this blob. I don't know what it is. It's just a ball of lava. Maybe it's nothing. It's just a bunch of universe dust or something. And God forms this into our planet Earth. And then, and then he breathes everything into existence, the, the surface of the Earth and, and the fish in the oceans and, and the birds in the sky and, and our, our um, environment that we have that's created. And he, and he blesses the seventh day and he sanctifies it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So six days during the week, we work, we do what we do. We're subject to noise and confusion and chaos. Uh, it was amazing. Carl and I were driving here um, to church this morning in my SUV and we were on, I guess, 19, right, Carl? And what, what do you think that motorcycle was doing when he went by us? 75, 80, I figure he was in the triple digits, the way he accelerated by us. And then as we were coming up here on Alderman, there's a car in front of us, we have the green light we're driving through, and a pickup truck just pulled right out in front. And how the car in front of us didn't hit him, I don't know. That's what it feels like every day of the week, for me, just about, when, when we're out and about um, in our lives within society, whether we're working or shopping or visiting or whatever it is, there's just this noise and confusion. The seventh day isn't supposed to be like that. You know, I, I was reading a blog on a group of Seventh-day Adventists who have been actively involved in the Zoom sessions. They were, we were talking about going back to church. And a lot of the people were like, we don't really know if we want to go back to church. We hope we do the Zoom thing forever. We still get together with friends, they said, but it, it avoids that whole chaos on Sabbath morning getting up, trying to get ready, getting things prepared, um, driving in ridiculous traffic, Saturday traffic to try to get there and the near hits and the near misses. And they were in this, I, I don't know if I agree with that necessarily, but I see the logic and the reasoning because there's so much noise and confusion and people are sick of it, is what it is. So God gave us a gift in the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the seventh day, that we're supposed to rest from all of that. And this good orderly direction, if it doesn't take place during the week, it should at least take place for us on the Sabbath. So we end this with a perfect situation. We're in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are our ultimate farmers there. They're having a great time. Everything's working out. And what happens? We return the world to chaos. So, so what's it called, again, Larry, when, when it starts and you come back to it again? A, a, what? a chiasm. So it's like a chiasmic event, right? Where we start in this place of disorder and God brings order to it and we end up in a place of disorder again. And once again, we're relying upon God <clears throat> in order to bring us back to order. Genesis 3, 6-7 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her. And what did he do? He ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Right? Jesus came and said, where are you? And Adam said, I'm hiding. Well, why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. And what did God say to him? Who told you that? So we have this perfect place and this one act of disobedience sets off a chain reaction. This is what chaos theory is about. We'll talk about this, the chaos theory and the butterfly effect. Sends off a chain reaction where that one seemingly small act, picking a fruit from a tree and eating it, sets an, into a chain reaction in, into um, motion that today, 6,000 or so years later, look where we are. Just from that one first sin of disobedience. So what is chaos? Well, chaos theory, I'll just read you the definition, deals with the behavior of certain nonlinear dynamical systems under certain conditions that exhibit the phenomenon known as chaos, most famously characterized by sensitivity to initial conditions. Examples are the atmosphere, 
Weather is a chaotic model. I mean, you know, we now have so much technology. We have satellites and Doppler radar and color this and that, and we still can't predict the weather more than a couple, three days out. Because one small, tiny perturbation in the, in the state creates some massive disruption farther down the line, and we just are not in a position to be able to know that or to control that. The solar system, plate tectonics, who can predict an earthquake? They try, don't they? They say, oh, there's been all these little micro, whatever they call them, in, in, along these tectonic plates, we're expecting a massive earthquake, and, and the people say, when? And they go, well, we don't have a clue. Well, I'm as good a predictor as they are. We're going to have some massive earthquake pretty soon, right? And, and someone might say, where? Now, I'm not really positive, and when's it going to happen? I'm not, not really sure. I'm expecting this big volcanic eruption soon, where? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. Probably somewhere out west. When? Yeah, probably in the next thousand years or so we should expect that. I mean, that's, these things are unpredictable because in chaos theory, you have what's called a prediction horizon. And what that means is that as the, we start in a state and this perturbations or these disruptions in the state begin as you move along a timeline, you come to a point what's called a prediction horizon. And it's at that point that chaos begins, that everything begins to go out of control. And we can predict up to that point, but beyond that we can't do it anymore. So all this science and all this uh, technology that we have allows us to, to move the prediction horizon a little bit to the right. But it doesn't change the fact that we're not God and we don't see the end from the beginning and, and we're not able to predict what the future holds. Again, remember six years ago, if somebody had said to you, hey, where are you going to be in five years? What do you think your life will be like? And you would have said, well, we'll be locked down in our apartment. We won't be able to leave and there's no toilet paper and we have to wear masks, you know, and people are fighting each other for water. Who would have believed that that would have been the case? But yet that's what our prediction would have had to have been in order to have been accurate. So we have something called the butterfly effect. Have you anybody heard of this? Right? It's kind of a common expression. The basic example is, is that if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, that eventually that perturbation, that disruption to the state could cause a hurricane here in Florida. Well, that's just not true. Right? Because if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, there's enough within the atmospheric conditions to absorb that so that we don't have that kind of a situation. But the butterfly effect says that small events can cause large disruptions. And one little sin in the Garden of Eden, one act of disobedience turned it from a perfect place into this chaotic mess that the world has become. And that's after we got so bad that the God flooded the whole world out and it started over again. What made us think that we could start this by ourselves and correct it and move forward and have it go back to where it was because it didn't happen that way. The butterfly effect is a phrase that encapsulates the more technical notion of what's called sensitive dependence on initial conditions <coughs> Excuse me, in chaos theory. The idea is that small variations in the initial conditions of a dynamical system produce large variations in the long-term behavior of those systems. Genesis 2, 8, and 9 is the perfect example of the butterfly effect. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. You just wouldn't figure that that one little act would have caused such a big event in the end. So I would opine that from the butterfly effect, we have what's called the sin effect. And the sin effect is sort of a Christian concept of the butterfly effect where one tiny little sin if there's such a thing, I guess, maybe there's not, you know? Maybe some people may look at it, but sin is huge. Jesus Christ died because of each sin that we committed. So I'm going to withdraw that statement and say there's no such thing as a small sin. There may be small events, but every sin itself is pretty big. In the sin effect, 
We can read, it says, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. <coughs> he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. And I know many women who have told me that's the biggest curse of all. And he shall rule over you. And sometimes, sometimes having kids, the pain doesn't end at childbirth, does it? Right? I mean, when you live in a world like this that's sin-filled, it's a fallen world, having children anymore becomes painful because they walk away sometimes from God. They separate themselves. And we as parents... I just I, I imagine it's just like God must be looking at us as children as we walk away from him, you know. <clears throat> then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, because you listened to your wife. Sue, you listening to this? <laughs> Are you out there? Because Jesus said, God said, because you've listened to your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. <laughs> Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. One event, one act of disobedience, one sin, changed this perfect garden that they lived in into farming as we know it today. Sorry, I have a, <coughs> a bad tickle as my father-in-law would say in my throat. Both thorns and thistles it will bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. <coughs> for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Are we supposed to be surprised by chaos? We're not. Really are we? Why? Jesus predicted it. Matthew 24, 4 to 13 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. <clears throat> All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another, and will hate one another, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Are we seeing that now? You know, I don't have a TV, I don't watch the news, but you know, you can't avoid, even on the internet, seeing stuff. I, I have <clears throat> these folders for medical and legal news that I get sometimes, and they talk about that stuff, you know, and, and it was just a very unfortunate um, situation. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, guys. I am. I think the pollen index is like a thousand on a scale of one to a hundred. <coughs> I was reading about Portland and the riots that are going on. It's been a year. Pretty much every day and every night for a year. Doesn't that seem like impossible? And yet, are we expecting these things to get better? We're not. We're expecting these things to get worse. Matthew lays out for us a course of events throughout the future. We see it in Daniel and Revelation and prophecy as well. We should not be surprised by what's happening here. Above all things, we can be disappointed and saddened because of the destruction of our earth and the people in it and our families and our friends. Let's not be surprised. Let's not act surprised because... If we're surprised, that means that we're not studied in what the Bible tells us. If we feel surprised, we need to go back to the Bible and we need to study more. Here's the thing. Well, I'll speak for me. I see this as chaos. I don't know if you do or not. But I look and see what's out there and it, it is chaos to me. You know, there was a, a group of physicists who were studying the flow of traffic because traffic is a really disruptive thing. <clears throat> Uh, poorly timed red lights or traffic lights and uh, poorly uh, uh, designed roads. 
result in about two billion hours per year of loss, loss of productivity. Figure out what an average person makes an hour, you can figure out the billions of dollars, but there's two billion hours a year, just in the United States alone, that we lose in productivity because we're sitting at lights or we're stuck in traffic. You ever been on the highway and you're driving along and all of a sudden traffic just almost comes to a stop and then it takes off again, but there's nothing there. There's no accident, there's no police, there's nobody on the side of the road. I'm trying to figure out what could have possibly happened. Maybe one person who merged inappropriately onto that highway caused the cars to slow down. There's a thousand cars in this line and if each car slowed down by a hundredth of a second, you have a 10 minute delay. I mean, really, think about it. That's what chaos, that's what the chaos theory predicts happens. But I would say that it's only chaos to us. <clears throat> it's not chaos to God. Matthew goes on to say, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. When that happens, people are going to look at that and say, this is totally out of control. This is pure chaos. But is it chaos? It's not because God's already predicted that these things are going to happen. God makes order out of that chaos. Then the sign, sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, <clears throat> and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Chaos is something that we create, guys. It's only in our minds that there's chaos. It's not in the heavenly component of, of the spiritual world that we live in. We as Christians know that chaos is a concept that involves interrelationary occurrences that are simply too complex for us to understand. <clears throat> so I would propose that when we see something that looks like chaos, I see chaos, that it's not chaos. There's just things going on that are beyond my ability to understand them. God has laid out a plan. He allows things to happen because of free will. I see it as being like nuts, wohu, wabohu, helter, skelter. But not in God's realm. In God's realm, there's order to this. I just don't get it. I can't see the end from the beginning. So to me, it's chaos. But it's not. We can't get lost in that and in the fear of it. Because when we do, it starts to feel like not even God's in control anymore. But that's just not true. God is in control. And while he doesn't will for bad things to happen, our will, he allows those things to happen. But he's in control all the time. <clears throat> we recognize that God stands for good orderly direction. And then in God's creation, there is only order. We, on the other hand, create chaos for this order. And God, in his infinite wisdom, then creates more order out of that chaos, which to us is only more chaos and less order. It sets up a cycle. God creates order. We create chaos. He orders it. We disorder it. Entropy takes over that says if things left on their own naturally descend into chaos. That's what sin did for us. We wouldn't have entropy if they hadn't sinned in the garden. I believe it. There will be no entropy in heaven. It won't exist. There won't be this natural movement towards disorder and chaos anymore. Chaos means there's just too many calculations for us to deal with. <laughs> That's all it is. If we could see the future, we might not be happy, but there would be no more chaos because we would know what's coming and what to expect. Free will, that's a gift. Although sometimes it feels like a curse as well. God is the primary and ultimate cause of all that happens, whether the fall of a sparrow, the fall of an empire, the rising of the sun, or the crucifixion of the Messiah. God's primary causation is usually mediated either through human choices or secondary or through the operation, I'm sorry, of natural laws. These secondary causes can act necessarily as in the falling of a stone to the ground, contingently as in the casting of a lot, or freely <clears throat> as in King David's decision to commit adultery with Bathsheba. Does that make sense? Right? 
God's primary causation is usually mediated either through human choices or through the operation of natural laws. The God of the Bible is the sovereign creator, sustainer, and redeemer who uses the humanly unpredictable and controllable forces of the natural world for his own purposes. People get sick, right? We pray for them, don't we? Is everybody healed? No. Some people die, and some people are healed. Chaos occurs around us as we see it all the time. So what do we do? We get confused, and we get angry, and discouraged, and depressed. <clears throat> but I would say that the reason that happens is because we forget who's in control or that anybody's in control. But he sees a purpose and an order to the process. God does. To him, it's all happening according to a plan. Free will creates chaos. And God creates order from free will. Isn't that great? Think about think what would happen in a world of free will without God's oversight at all. I mean, this is what this pandemonium is. We see godless people who don't believe that God's in control. And that's, this chaos is just, is just accelerating at a ridiculous rate, or at least as we see it as chaos. But while it is, it's, it's just the prophetic coming of the end of time. You know, the close of time for the planet Earth and for each of us. God orders both of those things. <clears throat> Colossians 1, 15 to 18 says he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation for by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth visible and invisible <clears throat> whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist and he is the head of the body in military terms, we would call him the head of the spear. He's the ultimate commander in control and the leader. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he may have the preeminence. Isn't that powerful? That's a powerful verse. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things that are created in heaven and earth Visible and invisible, thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, those are all things that are created and, and moderated and mediated by God. Psalm 33, 6 and then 9 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and what? It was done. He commanded and it stood fast. I'm going to close with this. <clears throat> and thank you, Claudette. Not only is it worked, but it's the first time I haven't chewed one of these. If, if you want to not chew a cough drop, be in a situation where you're speaking to a group and you know what that crunching sound will sound like. Because when I'm done here, I'm chewing this thing up. This is from the book, Affirmation of a Dissenter. It was written by Joe Sprague. It says, Above were the starry heavens, the abode of God. Down below was Shul, the place of utter gloom. And betwixt and between was earth, where powers from above and below did battle for the kingdoms of this world and the souls of human beings. Between Shul and earth was stretched the sea, not merely a body of water, but the mythological abode of chaos where the great demons Leviathan and Behemoth and even death itself loomed. Thus, Jesus the Son came from above to earth to do cosmic battle <clears throat> with the powers and principalities of the underworld for the souls of humans and the sovereignty of the universe. Therefore, where else could God's preeminent representative walk but on the sea where the enemy seemingly was in control? Seemingly, notice that word, was in control. Jesus walked on chaos and death and defeated both along with all the powers and principalities. In the end, we will return to Eden. In the end, the chaos will be gone. In the end, we will then be able to
to see the beginning of all things again on this earth. Fear, pain, um, discomfort, death, sadness, that'll be gone. Chaos, there won't be any more rioting in the streets of heaven. Nobody will have anything to object to. God will not only be in control, but everyone there will know that he's in control. Our behaviors will change, our characters will be taken with us. All we have to do <clears throat> is survive from now until then. Those that pass away, sometimes I think they're the lucky ones because all they have to do now is rest in the grave until Jesus returns. Sleep. Us, we have to keep on, keeping on. We have to continue to um, be affected by all the noise and confusion. But we don't have to believe that it's out of control. And, and what's going to, I think, what, for me, I'll speak for me, what helps me to survive day to day <clears throat> in the midst of all this is knowing that God's in control and that there's some plan out here, that it's not just chaos, it's just me not able to understand the calculations that are being made by God. So each of us has a chance, has a promise for eternity. Um, we just can't give up. And it's not easy right now to keep going for some people. We have to pray for those who are weaker. We have to be um, soldiers in the army of heaven. We can't do it on our own, but we need to spend a lot more time uh, invested in our relationship with Jesus because that's the only thing that's going to save us. Amen? All right, thank you.